Good morning, everybody. Quieten down, please. <laughs> I'm only joking. Are they clo- Is there more coming in? They're sticklers for timekeeping. Uh, Sam's looking nervous. He's wondering what I'm going to say about him, that's why. Okay. I think let's get going. That's most people. Thanks for being here today. Uh, This is my 15th year, I think, at the WCN Expo. It's a highlight of the the year for us and an incredible occasion that we thoroughly enjoy. It's my great pleasure today to be able to introduce Dr. Sam Williams and his partner in, uh, in crime, Maricela. Uh, Sam and I have a few things in common. We both grew up in the UK. Neither one of us can remember why we really like wildlife. A bit like Jane Goodall last night. We, we were probably just born that way and had parents that certainly didn't discourage us and gave us a lot of encouragement in many ways. Sam ended up building aviaries in his garden, which probably drove his mum crazy. He travelled out to Mauritius when he was 16 years old, and that was his real aha moment. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And now for more than four years, he's been in Costa Rica and set up with Maricela the Macaw Recovery Network, which they're now going to tell you all about the fantastic work that they do out there and um, saving one of our most enigmatic and uh, fascinating species. So I'll hand over to Sam. It's wonderful to be here and, and as Peter said, it is the highlight of our year and your enthusiasm and your support gives, gives us conservationists a tremendous boost. I'm going to start today with a question, and hopefully it, uh, it'll work. How many of you know The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams? Oh, that's good. That's good. Well, you may remember it's a story about the Earth being destroyed by hideous beasts, uh, hideous beings. From, it's a science fiction story. Seeing that it was happening, Douglas Adams traveled around the world in the 80s visiting conservation projects. And he wrote this book in 1990 called Last Chance to See. This book uh, I borrowed when I was 15 years old. I still intend to give it back one day. Um, And in it, uh, Adams describes, hilariously describes, adventures of conservation on the island of Mauritius. And there were conservationists driving around in Land Rovers, going up and down mountains in forests and, and chasing after birds. And of course, that just captivated my imagination. I wrote off to the the organization and uh, somehow managed to convince them to let me go and work with them. And at that time, I I worked with the echo parakeet, and at that time, there was only a dozen in the world. There's a very similar species which is common, but the echo parakeet's only found on the island of Mauritius. So there I was. I actually was 16 when I went into the field and uh, got to climb trees. Here I'm installing a supplemental feeder. I look very goofy, but... I'm clearly having a tremendous time, and as Peter said, it was very formative for me, and, and it's really just, it's been, I realized that I wanted to do conservation. So now I work with a slightly larger green parrot, and this is the great green macaw. Responding to her, par- her partner's call, Mrs. Macaw leaves the eggs where she's been incubating, and she'll fly off to be fed. Like the echo parakeet, the great green macaw is not that well known. They're, they were considered by early traders as a boring green parrot. So they, they weren't very popular in trade. I imagine you're much more familiar with showy species like the scarlet macaw. For me, some of you have heard this, but for me, this is, these guys are like an American corvette. They're brightly colored, and then they, they scream, look at me. The great green macaw is more subtle and more sophisticated. 
They're more like, they're, when, they, when they only reveal their beautiful colors when they fly, they're more classy like a British Aston Martin. <laughs> now here we've got an imposter. This is not a macaw. This is the yellow-naped Amazon parrot. Their populations are declining very rapidly, and we know that we just have to be involved. Now, to continue the car analogies, these guys are like a classic Land Rover. They're extremely uh, popular, which is very unfortunate for them. And when you see them fly, you might wonder if they're going to break down before they reach their destination. In fact, they're so pathetic when they fly, you might wonder if penguins could do better. Now, there's a combination of trade and habitat destruction that's affected each of these species. Parrots have actually been traded for millennia. Julius Caesar had a parrot, or parrots, and so did Alexander the Great. And that's back in, yeah, well, years and years and years ago. But even uh, the scarlet macaw was very popular with nobles, and any, any noble worth their salt had uh, one of these glamorous parrots. And so they, the scarlet macaw featured in lots of European art from around the 1600, uh, 100, 1600 onwards. Now, as well as being beautiful, parrots are very intelligent and a little bit cheeky. And the, I think the most endangered thing in this picture is that lady's nipple. Uh, there's <laughs> no way I would let a parrot anywhere near mine. <laughs> now, when we look at the great green macaw, it's all about habitat. When we have beautiful forests like in the top left corner, that, just is a, that contains a wealth of diversity. It's really f phenomenal what's there. And in, in the pasture areas, it's just not comparable. And so when in the 1950s, North America's booming fast food industry drove a lot of habitat destruction, that was a, a major concern for the great green macaw. Now the population, the, the population is threatened more by pineapple expansion. In the year 2000, there was 7,000 acres of pineapple in the area where we work, and now there's over 55,000 acres. And this, of course, is a, a desert for any wildlife. It's a, it's a terrible monoculture. I find it quite interesting that just a month ago, at the UN, Costa Rica was named a champion of the environment, or something along those lines. But actually, this recent conversion of, of pineapple has, has, a study has shown that 720,000 trees have been cut down to make way for the pineapple. That's also released 1.2 million tons of carbon. And pineapple is uh, a terrible crop that needs a ton of agrochemicals. It, in Costa Rica, which is one of the world's worst polluters for agrochemicals, there are more than four times as many chemicals used per acre as in the United States. The mountain almond tree, which is home for the great green macaw, is a magnificent tree. It's 180 feet tall. When they bloom, the entire crown goes purple. You might not have noticed, but there's actually a fully grown human down at the bottom there. So the, the, the trees are a really important food source for the parrots, and they eat the nuts that this tree produces. Young birds have to learn how to do that. These are birds at our captive breeding center that are young birds who are working out. Sometimes your left foot is better than your right foot. You have to really concentrate, and it takes all your strength. It's hard enough on your own, but it's near impossible when somebody is trying to steal your nut. And this guy is relentless. Now watch the second bird across and listen. He's got it, worked it out, and now he's just going to work out how to get the kernel and drop the outer, and you'll see it just on, in his beak in a second. There you see it there. So that's a process they have to learn how to do that. The mountain almond tree is also the nest tree for the parrots, and 90% of known nests are in mountain almond trees. This particular tree is has a cavernous nest, and macaws don't make a, gar a nest like a garden bird with twigs. They, they need a pre-existing cavity. This one is about six foot deep. Now, the mountain almond tree is, grows to be an ancient tree, and they live for 650 years. Now, that, that's kind of, oh yeah, 650 years. Yeah. Well, that means that this tree, if, if this tree, which is an ancient tree, was, is, is about that old, it means that 
this tree was a seedling in the 1300s. By the time Columbus arrived in the Americas, this tree was twice as old as anybody's grandma. She grew this tree. I, like, I don't like to think of it as just it, but as an individual. So she grew. She fed great green macaws, not caring that Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa, one of our achievements, or that she didn't much care for Shakespeare. By the time she was in her golden years, no, I've missed one, when she was 300 years old, that's the first time we use the word extinct. That's the time that America was founded. By the time she's in her golden years, we have our big achievement, the Industrial Revolution. And by the time Armstrong and Aldrich walked on the moon, the full moon had shone down upon her leaves over 8,000 times. In the time we'll be talking today, a human with a chainsaw could cut her down. And that is a terrible tragedy. It's happening today. Illegal logging is still happening, even in Costa Rica. And it's a major concern, because the mountain almond tree has very desirable wood. And when we lose those nest trees, then the macaws don't have anywhere to breed and don't, can't perpetuate their, their population. Now let's move on to the yellow-naped Amazon. These guys are just incredibly charismatic, and, and so they're highly desired as pet birds. Let me show you how charismatic. <coughs> It's easy to see why people want them as pets. But unfortunately in Central America, pet birds live in terrible conditions. These are extremely social and, and intelligent species, and yet they're living in a, a depriva sensory deprivation chamber in total isolation. Parrots live a life of adventure flying over the forest, and yet this bird can barely open her wings. Now, I know that I'm painting a pretty dark picture of things. This is a kind of good cop, bad cop routine that we've got. Maricela gets to do the good cop. She's going to tell you about the great work that we're doing at the Macaw Recovery Network because it doesn't have to be this way. For me, it's all about the forest and the ecosystems in it. I'm not so crazy in love with parrots like Sam is. I can still remember some of my best memories are from times in Costa Rica's rainforest. I can still remember the first time I saw a cicada coming out of its pupae or walking among giant trees and seeing spider monkeys. So all these amazing experiences sparked my interest in nature and my desire to study biology. Now I feel the duty to protect the natural world, whether that's through, out, through improving our knowledge of it or the livelihoods of people in direct contact with it. Nature has bring me joy and awe. Now, our team gets to experience those feelings every day when they spend countless hours in the field checking for nests. This is our wild population monitoring. Through monitoring, we can ensure, take action to protect chicks. Having been fed by her partner, this female returns to her nest. Each season, our team checks all 100 known nests. These, these are spread over an area of more than 1,000 square miles, so it takes a lot of coordination. That's where Mario comes in. He is the leader of our field work, and this is the whiteboard where everything is plan planned out. Mario is here with us today, so you can chat with him uh, at our table later. Almost all gray green macaw nests are mountain almond trees. These trees are protected, but unfortunately, the forest around them has been cut down. This is really bad for the chicks because they would normally crash land into the canopy surrounding these emergent trees. Now they don't have anywhere to go. So each year, we find at least one chick on the, on the wet grass of a pasture. Mario and the team have built a strong network with farmers and landowners in the communities where these nests are. 
and they let us know when they find a chick in the ground. So this happens last year. This chick is Reginald, and the, the team quickly came to rescue him. They built this platform and put him back into the canopy, and his parents were able to re reunite with him. But it's not always a happy ending like this. Um, this year, this is Walt. It took five days for Walt to be able to reunite with his parents. We also manage a population of starling macaws. These are a little bit different because they ha there are captive bred birds that we have reintroduced. And unfortunately, some of the pairs tend to choose these old palm trees that are about to fall to put their nest in. So one night after a torrential rain, this particular net flooded and the cheeks were trapped in cold water. So if you pay close attention to the next video I'm gonna show you, you can hear the cheeks in distress. We needed to get these chicks out, but we couldn't climb directly into the palm tree, so several of our team had to hold a ladder next to it. Our bird manager was able to rescue the chicks. These nests are not very clean, but she didn't mind that the chicks were covering poop, so she held them against her skin to warm them. Then we take them to our center, clean them, fed them, and put them into a brooder to warm through. We knew we had to get them back with their parents, and Sam wasn't in the field that day, but he had an idea, and he wanted the team to build a nest box that could be placed next to the palm tree. Uh, so he sent the team one of his usual architectural designs. <laughs> Amazingly, the team was able to build the nest box and put it up in a few hours, so we put the chicks in and sat back anxiously waiting for the parents. At the beginning, they were a little bit confused. Uh, we could hear the chicks, so we knew they could too. Um, the male was still, still trying to make sense of it when the female, being the smartest of the two, <laughs> figured it out, and she reunited with her chicks. Unfortunately, one of the chicks died a few days later, but the other one was able to fledge, and he has been seen in the area flying with his parents. It is very important for us that our work is based on science. So along with partners from Costa Rica and Nicaragua, we conducted a binational count at the beginning of this year. This involved over 60 volunteers, so it was a great opportunity to involve the community. Here, Albert is one of our employees. He is part of a training program where we give him um, opportunities to develop professionally, opportunities that he otherwise wouldn't have in the area where he is from. Here, Albert was part of the count, but we hope that in the future he can lead initiatives like these with Scarlet Macaws and Yellow Nape Amazons. Our work with Grey Green Macaws is not it's very recent. We have been focused in the bio biology of the birds, but we, of course, want to involve the community, the local community, in the conservation of the gray green macaw. So this here is Pamela. She is a Costa Rican master student that we are supporting. She has been conducting um, surveys and interviews with communities to see what their situation is and what are their desires. We want uh, our work to be based on science. We have great admiration for Peter's work with the painted dogs, but another um, organization that have been working for longer time, we're not there yet. Nevertheless, we do have some community projects, and a great thing about having a reintroduction site is that we can give kids the opportunity to be in contact with wildlife. So here is Sarah with these kids. She had them making enrichment toys for the birds, and they all seem to have a good time. Maybe only not that girl over there that is like, mmm. <laughs> Sarah also worked with the kids' parents and this group of uh, women. She made 
this art that we sell to our visitors. And that's our way to support them. We also try to give them new ideas for their art. So here is Brittany uh, teaching them how to make these bracelets. So another, other, we have a lot of ideas to develop our community uh, outreach. And we were very fortunate this year to send Albert, to be able to send Albert to Proyecto Titi in Colombia to learn from Rosamira and Johanna and their project where kids are training dogs. So our parrots are also poached for pets, like the little monkeys. So this is a, um, these training programs are a great alternative to, to that program. Uh, so we have a lot of ideas. We've talked about with Sam about after school junior ranger programs and community monitoring. And we have much more ideas. The threats. The The threats facing parrots are actually global in origin, and so that actually means that you are part of the community that we need to influence. One of the biggest challenges for the Great Green Macaw is the loss of habitat. And to the north of Costa Rica is Nicaragua, which is home to the Great Green Macaws. Half of the Caribbean rainforest has been cut down, and it's the third biggest supplier of imported beef to the United States. Costa Rica comes in as eighth, just behind Brazil. So if you're eating imported meat, then there's a very good chance that that could be impacting the parrots. There are alternatives. There's a, a new organization as far that I'm learning about, which is Force of Nature, which is doing very good quality uh, meat up here in the States, which is local for you. And so I would encourage you to sort of reduce your consumption, but in improve the meat you're eating. Or you could try an alternative. There is the Impossible Burger, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Pee-wee at the last expo at three of them before realizing they were vegan. If you like pina coladas. Then you are definitely impacting Great Green Macaws. Virtually every pineapple coming into the States is imported, that's eaten in the States is imported. And 84% of imported pineapples in the United States come from Costa Rica. So, I'm not going to offer you an alternative because, quite frankly, I can't stand pineapple. You can eat anything else and it'll taste better, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Habitat is critical for all wildlife. And so, if we're going to safeguard populations, then we need to be working with the community, which is work that we're developing, and we also need to work with the habitat. And so, that's an area that I'm very interested in. I talked earlier about ancient trees, and I think that we have a moral obligation to protect those ancient trees. But there's also this little issue of climate crisis, and, and that drives food insecurities and human migration. So whichever way you look at it, there's a reason to protect forests. We are working on that protection. Uh, um, we have actually had Don down. We're trying to develop our monitoring and trying to understand Don and Carol, sorry. And um, we are very keen to, to get into that. We've actually started with some restoration work. We developed a native plant nursery. We're developing a native plant nursery. But it's so much in the development at this point that we don't really have anything to show you. So here's one I made earlier. This is Julianka, a wonderful woman on the island of Bonaire in the Caribbean. She's now leading an organization called ECHO, after the ECHO parakeet, which I founded in 2010. What started as a collection of trees in our back garden uh, became this nursery and another nursery as well. And we're working, I'm not working, Julie Anker is working with uh, local communities to grow the plants in the nursery and then to plant them out in the wild. And some of those plant species, all, many of them are locally rare, but some of them are actually globally rare and more endangered than the parrot that drew me to the island in the first place. So this is, this is a fantastic initiative and we would love to be, be doing that. And the point is, that, like all of the conservationists here today, you have many ideas, but like all of the conservationists today, our team can get stuff done. Now, I started with Last Chance to See, a story basically of extinction and efforts to prevent it. Coincidentally or serendipitously, this month's National Geographic is last of its kind, a story of extinction. 
we're talking about extinction, and it's 30 years since this book uh, was written. But in the National Geographic this month, on page 25, there are a few stories of population recoveries, and some of those are from Mauritius. We have the tools to save species and prevent extinctions, but we need to move from ideas to action, and that's where you come in. Your support can make that possible. I can't wait to turn ideas into reality, and I can't wait to see populations of macaws and parrots thriving once again. Maricela and I are very determined to see this through, and we're not going to stop until we achieve it. We hope that you will join us on this journey. Thank you. Okay, two questions. Young sir. Do the green macaws corner better than the red ones? Do they what, sorry? Do they oh, corner better? Well, naturally. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a muscle car versus a uh, high performance British stylish car uh, comparison to make there, I think. Very good. Sam, would you comment about the percentage of adult great green macaws that make up the breeding population versus the total number of macaws in the popula sure. adult population? So actually, something I missed out there was uh, that the, the, with the great green macaw, we're looking at a total population of 1,500 birds in the world across six countries. Now, in Costa Rica, we're continually working on our census work to uh, have a better understanding of how many birds there are and whether our work is having an impact. And our, our census work indicates that we're looking at between 200 and 300 birds in Costa Rica. We know of 100 nest trees that were at used at some point in the past, but only 40 of those nests are active that, that we know of at this time. So we're looking in Costa Rica at about 80 breeding birds out of a population of 200. So it's half of the population is breeding. So maybe we can extrapolate that across, and we're still, we're still looking at a breeding population of in the hundreds, maybe 700 or something like that. It's very, very difficult to, to, to confirm that, uh, but um, that's kind of where we're at, what we believe to be the case at this time. Can we get one more? Or we had a quick one with the same guy. Yeah. Can you speak to any ideas that you have for how to kind of d disrupt the economy so that people want to preserve the rainforests rather than cutting them down? Yeah, I mean, that's, that is, um, you know, we're a small NGO, and uh, we now have seven Costa Rican staff, and um, if we're looking at tackling the, the, the fundamental threats instead of just the symptoms, then that means taking on North America's fast food industry. And uh, that's maybe a, you know, I like a challenge, but uh, that's, that's a big one. So, yeah, we, we don't know. I mean, we've, we're interested, one of the ideas we've had is, can we uh, work with farmers on the ground, help them develop better practices? They, there is good science that shows that having cows under trees actually improves the productivity of the cows, and you might get something from the tree as well. Um, but that science hasn't translated into conservation action. So maybe we can work with those farmers, um, educate them and help them develop better practices, and then create a parrot-friendly beef. You know how you have bird-friendly coffee? Why can't we do that with, with beef? And make it make a market incentive there as well. So that's one idea. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's just, uh, we haven't quite got to the point where we're looking at tackling that, but we're, what we're doing in our sort of, we're really interested in behavior change, and we're, we're at the beginning of uh, in building that trust with the communities and understanding what their situation is and finding out how we can work with them, what the opportunities do. Is it that they want their kids to go to, to school, to university? Can we help that happen? And can we then, you know, through that process, get to know them better and, and work on better initiatives? Um, I think there's, I mean, there is a global movement uh, of awareness on, on sort of meat eating and beef. I mean, it's not only the cows, but the, the, the soy that's grown to feed the cows and things like that. So there's a whole range of things there. I'd really encourage uh, conscious purchasing of, of meat if you're going to eat it or if you're into it then go for the the alternatives the sort of, you know the vegan stuff 
I'm not sure if that gets all, but well, thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, maybe I'll wait a moment or we'll get straight into it. Get on with it? Okay. So now it's my turn to introduce uh, Peter. And when Zizier realized we were introducing each other, he said to me, be nice. I have tremendous admiration for Peter and his work. For a start, he's old, and I hope to be old one day too. But Peter actually gave it all away. I mean, <laughs> my, my experiences and my, my uh, journey to conservation very much follows Peter's, where Peter, as a young, young lad growing up in Britain, was very interested in wildlife without an explanation. And that became more focused on dogs. And, and Peter got to go to Africa at the age of 18 and has been working with the painted dogs for over 20 years in Zimbabwe. And the work, like Maricela said in our presentation, we have so much admiration for Peter's work and looking at the great stuff that they're doing with bush camps and, and all the other community work they're doing. And, um, and of course, we're dog lovers, and, and so it's with great pleasure that I can introduce Peter today. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. The other thing we have in common is we love cheese. <laughs> and we have this WhatsApp group, and we have kind of, he's the king of the cheesy jokes, but anyway. So... Yeah, 20 years, 20 minutes to talk about 20 years plus of my life. Um, doing all we can to protect and conserve painted dogs, painted wolves, African wild dogs, Cape hunting dogs. It's all one and the same thing. They've got so many names. Um, really doesn't make an awful lot of sense for a species that so few people actually know and certainly understand. Um, just to put some context into everything, there are fewer than 7,000 painted dogs left in Africa. Um, that's roughly 1% of what the former population was, although clearly the macaws are in uh, much more sort of dire straits. And I was very f interested to hear from, uh, from Sam's talk. We've been talking about extinction for 300 years. And we're still talking about it, and probably even more so today. And this is the problem. The, the, the threats to the wildlife are, they're more or less the same. It's habitat. It's habitat loss. It's ha management of habitat. It's human population expansion that encroaches on habitat. The, the farming issues, they're kind of the same, no matter what the species. It's, it's, it's the same challenges, the same threats. And there is a real possibility of many of these species becoming extinct in our lifetime. So, maybe I should move on from that picture. <laughs> what we're trying to do at Painted Dog Conservation is, is mitigate that. And you are part of that problem. Like Sam said as well, you're part of the problem, but very much part of the solution. And I don't know how many of you were at uh, Jane Goodall's talk last night, but she, t she talked really passionately and emotionally, as usual, but about what you can do right here and now, in your own backyard, and the difference that that can make collectively on a global scale. So this is what we need, and we need you to be part of our journey. We need you to be part of our story and be part of the solution to these things. We spend a lot of our time at Painted Dog Conservation dispelling some of the myths, some of the old stories, if you like, that, and particularly one of the things that the dogs, painted dogs have suffered from over the years is this kind of impression that they're a wanton killer. They'll go out there, they'll kind of kill everything in their path, they'll devour a whole herd of antelope. And it's just simply not true. Um, this is a not unfamiliar scenario. The dogs are resting, the, the impala, has this got a pointer on it somewhere? 
that one. The impala in the background here are very much on the menu for the dogs, but you can see they're not even, there's not a single impala with its head up looking. The water bucket at the front here is very rarely predated on by the dogs. And you can see how interested the dogs are in what's going on around them. They are not related to domestic dogs. A lot of their behavior, their, um, you know, I guess just a lot of their behavior will remind you of our favorite pet at home. Um, but they are not a close relative. I think Jane talked last night about what the, the percentage sort of genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees. And it's like, what is it, 1% or something like that? It's very, you know, very minimal. Painted dogs and domestic dogs, it's a little bit more. It's 3, 4, 5%. That's like the relationship between humans and baboons. So we cannot breed with baboons. We know people that <laughs> certainly when they've had a few drinks or something like that. Don would be a very good example of that. You would describe him as be a bit of a baboon, but that's not the same thing. They're not related to hyenas. Very, it's, uh, I, it, it astonishes me how often you hear that, that, oh, the hyena, you're like, no, I mean, that's a hyena, yeah? Just in case there's anybody got any doubt. This is a painted dog. This is Tate, who features heavily in the BBC documentary Dynasties and, and the, the book that I produce with uh, photographer and, and my co-author, Nick Dyer. Um, they don't even look the same. I don't know how you can even possibly confuse them. Here's a little clip of a den. This is a, a alpha female that we knew so well, Socks one of the most successful females in Wangi National Park. Sadly, she passed away, but a lot of her, she, a lot of her pups, her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are still thriving in the Wangi e ecosystem. It's all about the pups for the dogs. They're highly social, extended family units that care for the young, the sick, the old. Um, a lot of qualities that, frankly, if we emulated, uh, life would, and the world would probably be a better place. That's my son, Sam. Um, Sam, uh, my other Sam here, talked about our life growing up. And I, I, again, I grew up in the UK. I don't really know why. I would think I was just born with an interest, a passion, a love for wildlife parents that support that, and through a, a long, complex journey, I ended up in Zimbabwe, and painted dog conservation became a reality, but very much due to the support from you all here in this room. It seems to be a particular thing when we're in America, we have to do a bit of geography. I don't know why. You have some guy in a White House up there on a hill who has his own terminology for, this is Africa. <laughs> it's a continent, not a country. Zimbabwe's down here, which is where we're based. And within Zimbabwe, we, most of our work is done here, this Wangi National Park and on the peripheries, but we do a lot of work up in the north here. This is the Mid-Zambezi Valley. And the other main dog population is sort of down here in the low felt. But you're talking about 700 dogs, maximum 700 dogs in the whole of Zimbabwe. One of my proudest, I think, I guess one of the things that makes me most proud is the staff and the people at Painted Dog Conservation. You cannot work in conservation without working with people and the local communities. If you ignore the local communities, you are doomed to fail. We have more than 60 staff at Painted Dog Conservation, all from the local villages around us. And we'll take people, I would rather take somebody with the right attitude and 
nurture that, develop them, train them, and make them experts in their field, rather than bring in, with respect to highly educated, somebody from somewhere. You know, it's better to, you've got to work with the local people that live cheek by jowl with the population. So this is Jealous. Many of you have met Jealous. He's a Disney conservation hero from very humble backgrounds in villages outside of, on the edge of Wangi National Park. But he's an absolute expert in what he does. And that's just due t entirely to his attitude and, and commitment. And so many of our staff are being recognized. Maria, the same. Maria used to sell baskets on the side of the road. She's just been at Disney talking to Disney's interpretive guides about interpretive guiding. Yeah? Disney, Houston Zoo is another one. I don't know if there's anybody from Disney in here, but they, yep. They do a fantastic job. Disney Wildlife Conservation Hero Awards. And they're always looking for people to be nominated. And Maria Jealous has won it. Maria has won it. Uh, this is Belinda, one of our anti-poaching units. Belinda was a kid at our bush camp. She was at our bush camp when she was 11 years old. She's now 20-something, early 20s. Again, a recipient of this Disney Wildlife Conservation Hero Award and the Houston Zoo uh, Wildlife Warrior Award. And with that, she went to undertake training at a fellow anti-poaching operation, the all-female Akasingas, which is in Zimbabwe, um, run by the International Anti-Poaching um, Foundation. Lefius here, he's been with us for more than, uh, oof, 2001, what's the maths on that? What's the maths on that? 18 years. He's patrolled probably over 20,000 kilometers on foot picking up snares, and he's just been awarded the, from the, um, the Paradise Foundation uh, Ranger Award for recognition for his work. So this is what's really important. This is conservation in action. You work, these are all local people that we've got involved, we've employed, trained them up to become experts in their field. And David, is David in here? Where are you? Stand up. <laughs> that's enough, that's enough. So David should be stood here, not me, because everything that happens at PDC is his fault. <laughs> and I, I, frank, I do not know what I would do without David. The, the, he's taken on so much responsibility uh, for running day-to-day -day operations at, at PDC that it, it's incredible. And uh, just my hat goes off to the guy. He's a fantastic guy and sets a tremendous example for the rest of our staff. Again, local lad, grew up in Wangi. He used to look after Jealous. He, when Jealous was, uh, no, well, other way around. Jealous used to look after you, didn't they? Of course, he's older. So Jealous used to look after David when David was a kid growing up in Wangi. And then David went off, traveled around Africa, got with his, well, his father was a ranger with the national parks. So they moved a lot around Zimbabwe. He got educated in South Africa and he's been with us for several years now. And as I say, he runs Painted Dog Conservation. We talked earlier, Sam talked about habitat loss. I talked about habitat loss and the threats. One of the biggest threats and challenges that the painted dogs face is from poaching, illegal hunting activities. And it's a simple thing to mitigate. It's boots on the ground. And so many of you here support that. Kathleen was one of the first people to step up and support our anti-poaching operations. And she asked me, well, this was 20 years ago or something. Maybe not quite. And she's like, do you employ anti-poaching units? I'm like, I said, no, you do. Because you pay for it. You give us the money, the support that we need to put these guys on the ground. And it makes a huge difference. The problem is there's just not enough people doing it. We can protect this area 
with boots on the ground. But if our neighbors are doing nothing, it completely undermines what we're doing over here. And when that's happening on all sides, you end up with a year like we've had this year, where we've just dealt with so many issues like this. You know, this is telephone wire, copper telephone wire that the, the poles are like, you have problems here, isn't it? I mean, nobody's got power or something. It's like being in Zimbabwe. And it's the same there, you know, the infrastructure's falling down or people cut it down, they use the wire. It's driven by hunger, but it's a commercial, it's an illegal commercial activity. And we had a recent situation, one of the dogs that we have known and nurtured and protected and looked after for years, Fran, seven years old. I know how many of you read, get my newsletter, which I just give a shout out to Sherry Paul there who turns all my dribble and nonsense into something that people enjoy to read. So, um, But Fran, seven years old, she's been snared seven, five times in her life. That fifth snare killed her. And we arrested the poacher. The dogs tracked the poacher down. And we arrested the poacher. And he basically got let off by the magistrate. Because the magistrate's saying taking pity with it. Oh, well, these guys, he's got, no, he's got a job, but he's not been paid, and, you know, feeling sorry for him and everything. And I'm, I'm like, if the same guy broke into your house and stole your TV and sold it, giving the same reasons, would you let him off? And she's like, no. I said, well, why? So we've appealed the case, and we, we've engaged some uh, activists, a, law, a lawyer, sort of, what do you call them, activist group, and we're trying to appeal the case because it's just at the moment it's just not taken seriously. Elephant poaching, pangolin, rhino, it's taken very seriously in Zimbabwe. There's very robust laws, and no guys, they, their, you know, their feet don't hit the ground when they're in jail. But this kind of poaching still isn't taken seriously enough, and it's a big challenge that we face. But it's not all been bad this year. Again, if you read my newsletter, you'll be familiar with the Mpindo pack, which was a pack of dogs that had... We knew the alpha female, Snowtail. We didn't know her, her mate, Jonathan. And they den deep inside communal land, and they were predating on, on goats. We captured them. This is last year. We brought them to our rehab facility, we nurtured them. They grew up there. We released them. Two months later, they were back in the same place. They were like, okay. So then we had to recapture them, we, we engaged David and the team were down there a lot, engaging with the communities, getting them to at least tolerate the dog's presence up to the point where it was the opportune moment to capture them safely. So that happened again uh, earlier this year and then we reached a point where now we had to find a new home for them. So the old guys went to work Thanks, Sam, for that reference. This is something we've done. This is inside our rehab facility, which we've got very large enclosures, and it's the safest way to sort of capture and now move the dogs. We hang up these nets. We're just going to run them into the nets. You grab them by hand. It's a lot of fun. You've still got all our fingers. Um, we had a whole team, it, as it happened, we had a whole team of vets down there because we run a domestic dog vaccination program uh, where we just vaccinated more than 1,500 domestic dogs against rabies and distemper. <laughs> and which is a huge threat to the, not only the dogs, but the whole world. And as I speak now, we've got messages this morning about from Shivani, uh, in the Waso Lion project out there in Kenya, and they've got an outbreak of distemper there that's uh, killing the painted dogs up there. So we had, all, we had more vets than you could throw rocks at, so it was all went like really smoothly, processed the dogs through in crates. And again, what I love about all these things, you know, this is Primrose from the office, Maria. It's like everybody gets involved in, in, these, uh, in these operations and you know, willingly and, and enthusiastically. We worked with wilderness safaris. I don't know if there's wilderness are here. They're often here. There we go. Absolutely one of the, uh, 
one of the best safari organizations bar none. And they were tremendously, so we needed to find a new home for these dogs far away from communities. And we, we, we sort of identified through our work in Mana Pools area, we identified Mana Pools up there and wilderness got behind us like that to build the boma, put in all the, we, you know, we needed help. It's a long way from where our main operations and we needed support, the infrastructure support that wilderness have in place. We flew the, the dogs up on their plane. They took all the seats out. That I really don't know what the people who traveled in that plane afterwards thought. Because <laughs> as much as I love the dogs, they do smell terrible. So. But we, mo we flew them all up to, um, oh, straight. So I got them to Mana Pools and then released them. And it was so smooth and fairly effortless. <laughs> Little needed a bit of encouragement to come out. Little tap on the nose. Out goes one. They're all just sat inside and you're like, come on. This guy cracks me up. This is the pilot. And he's like, got his own selfie thing going on. Another one out. The pups are in there somewhere. So this is real. This is like just, this is conservation in action. This is what we, this is a, this is our day job. There was a few very excited clients at the camp. There's some of the pups coming out. I had to give them a little nudge. I think there's one more to go somewhere. Or maybe there's more pups. Yeah, there's more pups. Pilot's still got his selfie going. There go the pups. Still one more. This is Dad, the last one to come out. To give him a little nudge. Mind your fingers. And, and there you go, they're out. And it was just... <laughs> these are good days. And without wilderness support, we'd have, you know, we'd have been lost. So they're just really... Big thanks and a shout out to Wilderness for their support. It's brilliant. <laughs> so, Will, they, you know, they settled in nicely into their new enclosure. It's a big enclosure. It's, it's bigger than this room. Very thick vegetation, some high points. And we're going to hold them there, and Wilderness are going to feed them until probably April next year. And the idea there is that what you're trying to do, if, you, if we took them to minor pools and just released them, they would try to, get, immediately they would try to go back. It's, I mean, they have, I, I don't know how pigeons, homing pigeons work, but it's all the same kind of thing. Somehow they know where they are and they know where home is. And they're going to try and get there. Well, they're not, you saw that map at the beginning. They're not going to make it from minor pools right in the north all the way down through back to Wangi. So the, the, the idea is that you, the longer you keep them where you hope they'll stay, the more likely they are to stay there. So we're going to hold them in the enclosure here until sort of April next year and then release them happily into the wild. And meanwhile, life goes on at back in Wangi, our education work. We've had, again, close to 1,000 children again this year coming through our bush camp program working with Wendy and the artisans, making the crafts, some of the which you can buy outside there. And this is all, in, this is again, it's engaging with communities. It's bringing local people into conservation, benefiting from conservation in as many ways as, as possible. So that they're, they're part of it. They're, part, they're no longer part of the problem, they're part of the solution. And that's what you're aiming for all the time. Simple things like provision of water, is a life-changing thing. And that's what we've recognized over the years, dealing with the individual, changing, dealing with 
one individual one day at a time and the difference that it makes over time. Again, much the same message as Jane was delivering last night. It's like, what can you do right here, right now? And collectively, that makes a difference. And that's what kind of you know, keeps us going. That's what keeps us sane when you're on the front line of conservation. This is the vaccination program I referred to this year. And uh, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create an environment where the painted dogs can thrive. And you're part of that. We need your support. We need your help to do that. Send cash, checks, credit cards, anything, whatever. There's so many ways to become involved, whether it is purely the money. We've got Don here helping us develop drones to track the dogs to make us more efficient in the field. Peewee supplies us with fishing uh, lures and stuff so that in our spare time we don't go too crazy. David's a very keen fisherman. No, but whatever it takes, but you're part, I'm joking there, but whatever it takes, is you, you are part of the solution. And it's just a real privilege to be here and meet you all again, some like, new faces, some very old familiar friends at the front um, and if you want to buy a book which tells the story of these dogs that the BBC filmed and the story my story and the work that we do at Painted Dog Conservation as I said to create an environment where this incredible species can thrive and if this species is doing well a lot of other species are doing well. And again, what Sam referred to the same is habitat. If you're protecting that habit, if you're using the dogs to, as the vehicle to protect that habitat, a lot of other species are doing well at the same time. So thank you. I've run out of time. I've run over time. But who cares? Thanks very much. Oh, apparently with two questions, but it's lunchtime, so if you want to stay longer, I don't eat much anyway. Um, yes. You, when you showed the place where you have the dogs in a um, confined area for a while, and they're young, how do they learn how to hunt when you let them go? Okay, so how do they learn, the, the, the young dogs learn how to hunt? Yeah, because they, you've been only... feeding them, right? Yeah, we're feeding them. So the adults are obviously very proficient hunters. There's three adults in that pack. The young dog, they only start to participate in the hunt when they're about a year old. And, then, and they only become fully proficient when they're 18 months old. So it's quite critical. Your point is correct. It, when you release them is really critical. But they'll be about seven, eight months old when we release them. So they're still, that's the period when they are actually learning from the adults to hunt and, and participate. So, but it, it's quite critical when you do release them for exactly that point that you're making, yeah. So they have time to learn. Yep. When you have um, 700 dogs left, what are the genetics like when they are, you know, breeding and you're, you're putting them together um, as a group? Yeah, so the, it, it's a, it, to be honest, it's an area we're working on. Uh, we've got a collaboration with Stanford University here on the whole, the genetics. We've sequenced and assembled the genome, the whole genome, and it's ongoing work. Based on the information that we have, we know re reasonably well that that, that those, like, like we've moved these dogs from Wangi to minor pools, and that, that sort of the genetic, like Wangi's genetics is not very represented in minor pools area in the valley. So at uh, one level, that's a good thing. So now you've introduced new um, kind of a bloodline into that area, which is a, is a good thing. But when you talk to the geneticists, they're like, uh-huh, not necessarily. Because you, you, you can end up with a homogenous 
you know, they all, you've, got the, you've got the Blinstons here, the Smiths there, the Jones over there, but if you mix them all up together, they all, you all become one thing. So it's just it's something to keep, an, you know, to keep an eye on, and it's certainly not a unique situation to the dogs. It's a big issue with cheetah, I believe, where the population was so low. Um, and it's, you're looking for signs of how does that, any inbreeding or whatever, how does it manifest? Um, so you kind of keep a weather eye on it, and um, yeah, and we'd, 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 as I said, we're working with Stanford to try and get a deeper understanding of the, the level of diversity that we have out there. So I don't, they said two questions, but if anybody wants to ask another question, you can, or I'll be outside, not you, Kathleen. Or you can come to the table outside and we'll chat there.